Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. So today, uh, my story is all about being stamped and inked by God. Um, My story is about transforming myself. I've actually, I joked in the first service, I've reinvented myself four times. I'm going on my fifth reinvention. I love reinventing myself. I love what God does when he gives us the tools that we need, not only spiritually, but we pursue the physical tools we need, and I'll talk about that. But what I thought I would do is start with the definition of what it means to be inked for purpose. So the word purpose on slide one here, basically the word purpose from a biblical perspective, it declares why we exist on these, on the earth. And it captures the heart and the essence of why Jesus put you on this earth for impact, not for selfish gain. Great that we have a family. It's great that we can be successful and have a workplace and have a community and church. All of that is a, is, is a blessing. But we're here to make a difference for impact. And purpose in the Bible, it defines your life not in terms of how you see yourself, but how God sees you. Because God's vision for you, I don't know about you, but me, God's vision for me was totally different than my vision for myself. And you'll, you'll hear about it when I tell my story. But when we understand to see ourselves through God's vision for us in the biblical perspective of purpose, it anchors our life in character and it anchors our life in the call of God and the purpose why we're on this earth. And, and it, it, it impacts everything we do around our community, around our family, around our workplace. And it communicates to us We're here for impact and we're here for God to make a difference in other people's lives. And so my signature life scripture is wrapped up in Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares God, plans to prosper you and to not harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. And that hope and future is all wrapped up in who God says that he's going to do, and what God says he's going to do through you, not in what we think of ourselves. Sometimes when we go through life and we face tragedy or we face trauma or we face addictions or we face issues or we face failure or we just face life, we tend to see that through the lens of our current situation and we forget why God created us. We forget who he is in us. So it's important for us to understand that God put us on this earth. When you're, when you come into adulthood, you're, you're, you're literally created with four feet of space around you. Literally, that's your influence. Me, myself, and I, right? And how you manage that four feet of space depends on how God increases that impact and increases that space and gives you more influence and gives you more impact. And so it's super important, ladies and gentlemen, to understand why you were given that four feet of space and to do what you can according to God's word in order to make an impact. So, you know, the the word bondage and the word purpose are polar opposites of each other right? So it is possible to be a believer in Jesus and to live with shackles. It is possible. It is possible to be a Christian your whole life and to read God's word and to come to church pastors five times a week if you want to, every day of the week if you want to, and still be shackled with the bondage. I watched, and you'll read about it in my book. I tell very detailed, intimate stories. I watched my mother live in bondage, one of the most amazing teachers of the word of God pastors. She went to Bible school. She was amazing. But I watched her live in bondage that produced mental illness, that produced depression. And she was an amazing minister. But when she got off the pulpit, it was a different story. And I watched her live like that because she refused to deal with her past. And she refused to deal with the issues of her current state. And it was all under the blood of Jesus, she said. And you know what? Yes, it is under the blood of Jesus. When we come before uh, and accept Jesus, absolutely he forgives you. Absolutely he can deliver you. Absolutely he can heal you. But you have to do your part to deal with the issues of your junk. 
right? Yeah. So we have to deal and we have to deal hard. And those of us that are parents, listen, it impacts your children. It impacts your children's children and their children's children. I grew up in a generational cycle of poverty, addiction, loss, mental illness, trauma, you name it. That was my purpose. That was my DNA. Uh, I'm one of four children. Um, you'll read about it in the first three chapters of Lost Girl. Uh, I have a twin brother, a younger sister. Uh, my twin brother and I are Yugoslavian, so our dad was white. Uh, my sister's, uh, baby sister's dad was African-American, and my older brother's dad was Mexican. So we used to tell my mom, you just need the Asian to complete the circle of diversity. <laughs> she was an all-inclusive gal. Yeah. So uh, we never knew our fathers, okay? We grew up messed up. We grew up in El Paso in and out of project housing. Uh, my mother struggled with tremendous addictions. She was a heroin addict for 10 years. She was addicted to LSD. Uh, when I was two years old, she was put into the mental trauma at Big Springs Hospital for blowing her brains out with acid. We stayed with my grandmother for a year. When she came out, she continued to do drugs. All of us were born drug babies, all of us. She did not stop doing drugs when she was pregnant. And so, you know, I was born from a bet that my mother made, and you'll read about it in my book, at a club where she was a dancer. And that's who my father was. I don't know my father, never met my father. I just know that he was the owner of a club my mom danced at. And all of us uh, grew up in that. And so mom never dealt with her junk. She always, always, uh, even though she knew that God was real, her father was a pastor, she never really dealt with her junk. And so at the age of five, my mother told us she was going to the grocery store and never came back. My sister was six months older than the crib, and we were five, and my older brother was, um, was a little over six. And so, you know, we, we should have been in the foster care system if it weren't for my wonderful grandmother who came. My little grandmother, she didn't have as much as a fifth grade education, but man, she was an amazing anchor in our life. And she took us in, and she raised us, and she worked hard. Um, she took us out of the project housing and moved us into a little house and is still in East El Paso. But, um, you know, we didn't know where my mother was. She was gone for two years on the streets. We knew, we didn't, we didn't even know she was dead. We didn't know she was alive. We just knew that she was on the streets. And two years after that, when I was almost seven, my mother returned home. And when she returned, she was 90 pounds and she had tracks up, up and down her arms. She'd been living on the streets of Juarez in El Paso. And she was just in, in a, a big mess. And so she came back and she gave her heart to God and God delivered her from the addiction. But pastors, God did not, God wanted to deliver all of my mom, her body, her spirit, her mind, but she remained in bondage from her trauma and her past. And she went immediately from being a drug addict to being a minister, and she started going all over the world preaching the gospel, which is great. I'm all for that. But we were back here going, hello, what about us? Aren't we your priority? And so I grew up with that. At age nine, she finally uh, took us away from my grandmother, ripped us out of the only stable home that we had and brought us to Austin. We grew up in the hood over in East Austin, back when it was hood. Now it's all yippee and, you know, <laughs> saw some a white person walking their dog. And I'm like, dang, that didn't used to happen when I grew up in the hood. People riding their bike. And I'm going, wow, East Austin has changed. But anyway, we grew up when it wasn't like that. And, you know, she, she moved us into that little church where she and my grandfather were co-pastoring. And I was about nine at the time. And, you know, she was serving God. She was teaching the word. But the way we lived at home was an abject poverty. We were always struggling, waiting, you know, in line at the Salvation Army to get our shoes. And I'm all for temporary help when you need it. But God is not intending you to live in the pit literally your whole life. God wants to bless you. So I would hear these stories of this God of abundance. And I'm going, where's the abundance? We don't have lights. We're having to go get our milk at the, you know, the wick. And we're having to wait in line for our shoes. And my mother was just... A, Mentally, she had a lot of trauma, and so you know, at times she was she she just dealt with dealt with issues differently, and it really closed me up. So at, as a result, at the age of thirteen, I started doing drugs and went crazy, and I was determined I was going to self destruct because you know what I was going to get her back for everything that she did to me. She didn't care about me. God didn't care about me. Nobody cared about me. So if nobody cared about me, I was not going to care about myself. And as a 13, 14, 15 year old, those are formative years. Those are super important years. And so I had no value in myself. I didn't know that God had a purpose for me. And I went crazy. Um, 
At 17, I ended up pregnant. Um, I was a horrible student in school. I had a lot of learning disabilities and problems learning and comprehending and reading. And so I was a terrible student, but I dropped out of school. I got pregnant, dropped out of school, and, um, and moved back in with my mom. I had moved out when I was 16. Moved back in with my mom, and, um, and for the first uh, you know, nine months of my pregnancy, decided I'm going to have this baby, but I don't want her, so I gave her to my mom. My mom took her, and I was out on the street again. As soon, two weeks after I delivered, I was gone and on the streets um, and working as a cocktail waitress and you know, out partying and just thinking that you know, I, could, I, I didn't have a purpose in my life, and I didn't want to be a mother. I didn't want responsibility, um, and I certainly didn't want a relationship with this woman who had basically destroyed my life. My poor mother mother was um, a prayer warrior. She prayed and prayed for me. And I remember her dragging me to church one day and I refused to have anything to do with God. I was the kind of person that literally would curse God because I had seen my mother, you know, from age nine, when she got saved all the way up to, you know, and 19, when I got saved, I had seen her God and I didn't want anything to do with her God because her God was about sin and about sending you to hell and about bondage and about poverty and her God you know, if you didn't have do X, Y, Z, then you didn't get the abundance. It was a very, um, very hard religious message, Pastor. And it was difficult for me as a young lady to understand that. And so, you know, at 19, uh, kicking and screaming, she dragged me to church with her. And it was a different church than the church that she attended. She, there was a guest speaker there. And in that church, ladies and gentlemen, God got a hold of my life. I wasn't looking for God. I was in severe rebellion. I had my drugs in my purse. I was going to go party that night. And God radically and transformatively came down and touched my life in such a way that that day I gave my heart to God. I mean, it was so supernatural. I can't explain it other than to say he inked me and said, it's time. You're done. No more of that craziness. And I can tell you that my mother, um, she knew that she had failed as a mother, but she knew one thing. She was a prayer warrior and she knew how to pray. And she had been praying for me and believing for me and trusting that even though she failed, God would never fail her. So if you have children or adult children in this room and you've been praying for them and believing for them and they're in their mess, I encourage you to stand and believe for purpose in your children. You stand and believe the word of God that they are going to come to the Lord and, and walk in freedom. And so I thank my mother for that. I always, and in my book, I talk about her redemp, God's redemptive power, because in all those years of mess, God really redeemed it when my mother stood with me um, in prayer and also raised my daughter for me. So my daughter wouldn't go into the foster care. So I, I joined a little church where my husband was. He talked to you a little bit about that a couple of weeks ago and began to let God grab a hold of my life, grab a hold of my heart, change my thinking. I got myself around a, a past, a youth pastor and his wife and youth leaders. For the first time in my life, between the ages of 19 and 21, I began to hear, Rebecca, you have purpose. Rebecca, God has a plan for you. I read Jeremiah 29, 11. I read a scripture in the Bible that says, I formed you in your mother's womb and in your mother's womb, I knew your name. I thought, wow, God does know me. God does love me. And so I began to change my thinking and get the word of God and get mentors and counseling. I dealt with a lot of mental trauma and a lot of uh, physical and mental abuse. So I had to work through that through a lot of help. I married my husband. I entered into a welfare to work program for a woman by the name of Ann Richards. I was determined to get off of welfare and have a career. I didn't know how I was going to do it, but I knew that God was on my side. And um, I worked for Ann. How many remember Ann Richards? She was a little fireball. And it was the first time, ladies, in my life that I saw a woman in power because I had never seen women in power. I didn't even think think in my community and in my background, women belong barefoot pregnant in the kitchen. That's where, that's just the way it was. Uh, my grandfather was very chauvinistic in his upbringing. And so that's how we grew up. And so when I began to see her, I really began to think maybe it's possibility for me to be something else than just, you know, this person with no career. And so I went back to school. I then worked for a woman by the name of Kay Bailey Hutchison. I don't know if you all remember her. Kay Bailey was a treasure. She was an amazing person. I had a mentor that came alongside me that was an executive woman who said, Becky, at the time, they used to call me Becky. Becky, you have potential. I want to send you to school. I want to t train you in communication. And I began little by little embracing the things that God was trying to do in my life, embracing the people that had come to me to say, you don't have 
have to live in mental trauma. You don't have to live in poverty. You don't have to live in addiction. You can overcome it. My husband has been a huge part of my change and my transformation. And you know what? There's times where I didn't want to let him speak into my life. Uh, you know, when he had something to say, I'd be like, well, who are you to tell me? And you know what? God had to deal with my heart in that too, because when, when we, God brings a woman and a, and a man together, he brings us together for purpose. So your biggest champion should be your husband or your wife. That is your best friend. And so that's how it's been with us. And so it wasn't always like that in the beginning though. I remember one time when I was in that welfare to work program, it was right, right after we got married or right before we got married, he, I was answering the phones for Ann Richards, smacking my gum. I was all East side. Um, and I, hello, Ann Richards office, smack, smack. And Debbie would say, babe, don't be smacking your gum. You're not from the hood anymore. And I'm like, well, that's offensive. Like I can smack my gum if I want to, but he was trying to communicate. Look, you're in a different position now. You need to communicate different. You need to hold your head up high. I learned, I started to learn and watch women in power and women in influence and started to think, I want to be like that through education, through mentors, through spiritual transformation, through counseling, all those things began to transform my way. And ladies and gentlemen, that first job in 1989, was the first and the last job interview I ever had in my entire career. From then on, God opened a door. Then he opened another door. In 1995, I got a call from that mentor of mine who was my amazing mentor. She's in my book. And, he's, and she said, guess who I'm working for? I'm working for the new governor, George Bush. I want you to come over and be my deputy. He had just gotten elected governor and she brought me over to the Capitol. And my husband and I had gotten married already. We got married when I was 21. And, you know, he adopted my daughter and we began our journey together. I didn't have a model for a mother or a wife or a home. We just kind of figured it out. I mean, David came from dysfunction. I came from dysfunction. And we were just like trying to figure it out together at the same time serving in our church, serving in our community, trying to raise our children in the way that we felt God, you know, was asking us to raise them and trying to make a difference. Each step along the way, our career is growing. So ladies and gentlemen, God is a holistic God. He does things total, complete. You cannot compartmentalize your life. This is your wife, your marriage, and this is your family, and this is your church, and this is your career. No, he is a holistic God. He wants to do things totally and completely so that he can work in a, in a whole way in your life. And so that's what he did with us. The same time that our careers were growing and we were growing in our, in our, in our financial, you know, success with our career, our family was growing. We were investing in the community work and doing community work in our church. Everything was working together for God's purpose, but it was very difficult. When you look up the word severely dysfunction in the dictionary, I'm sure you'll see David and Rebecca by it right there. It'll say that's who they are. Um, that's who they were. And so who you are today does not need to be who you are tomorrow. And who you were yesterday doesn't need who, who, do you, who you're going to be you know, many years from now. And so embrace that and understand that God does a, a, a purpose in your life for a reason. He causes transformation. And it's usually going to take you to do the really hard work on yourself. So um, in, in, as you all know, uh, in 2000, in, in 2000 uh, Governor Bush ran for president, and I never dreamed that I would have an opportunity to work for a president. I had already achieved so much, and David and I had just built a house. He had just got a big promotion in the high-tech industry. I had just, you know, uh, we, our kids were in their new school, and we were like, man, we've arrived. And God said, no, 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 it's time for you to move again. And he pulled us out of Texas and put us in a planet called Washington, D.C., there's a chapter in my book called Washington, D.C., a planet of its own, and it is a planet. I always tell people, I was just there last week, and I told a couple of my friends who are in, in government, I said, y'all need to come out in real America and live in Austin or in Dallas or <laughs> come to Texas. Uh, but no, really, Washington is such a different town. And so when we were rooted up and we were literally put alongside a president, I was overwhelmed with just the sheer move. Never been out, lived out of Texas in my life. 
life. My first plane ride was my honeymoon with my husband. Okay. And so I was 21 when I took my first plane ride. And so, um, you know, when I arrived in DC, it was overwhelming. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is a big job. How am I going to do it? But God gives you, if God opens the door, he gives you the ability to take the steps to get the job done. And don't question God's ability. What you have to do, what I had to do was own my own learning curve and say, okay, this is a little bit above my head, but I'm going to learn it. And I'm going to study and I'm going to talk to people who know more than I do. I'm going to watch them and, and become a sponge for transformation. So, you know, it, it's, it's super important for you to understand that when God does a work, he wants to do it in a complete way. And he's never really finished. So uh, he, he, with us, he's worked in steps and process. And all of it has come with our ability to embrace our own stuff and to embrace our own transformation, to embrace dealing with our own issues. There are three keys I want to share with you here today that are so important to your transformation and have been to my transformation. And there are many in my, in my last chapter, I share about seven to 10 keys and things that have, have been valuable in my life. But I'm going to leave you with three today that I think are so important. I call them key drivers to your success. A driver is like the car. You get behind the wheel and you're in charge, right? So it's the driver that's going to help get you to that, to that place of, of transformation and success to be inked for purpose because you can have purpose. Listen, my mom had purpose. She was called. She died prematurely. She's in heaven today. And she died prematurely at age 62 because she never dealt with her junk. She buried it. It was under the blood. She buried it. And so I want all of us to embrace our purpose, but I want us to deal with, with what God is asking us to do in terms of our keys. So number one, we must shift our way of thinking. We must understand who we are in Christ and understand the power that we hold in that divinity, in that divine authority. When God says that we are created in his image, he's not just talking about some supernatural thing up here. You literally are created like Christ. Divinity in Colossians 2, 9 and 10 says, for in him... All the fullness of deity, that is the Godhead, dwells in bodily form, and in him you have been made complete. Therefore, he is the head, and he has given us rule and authority and power over all. Not when you get to heaven. A lot of people, pastors, they think, oh, yes, when I get to heaven, I'm going to rule. No, God wants you to rule here on earth. And ruleship doesn't mean you have to come into this great place of influence. Your story, my story, different stories, different journey. But we can all take our place of authority and we can all take our place of ruleship. You are created in the image of God, and therefore he's infused you with his anointing. He's put your, his favor upon you, and nothing is impossible for you to achieve. Nothing. Listen, my story, when you read Lost Girl, you're going to be blown away. I'm blown away. I, I, I've read it 10 times. David and I were talking about it the other day. Keep reading it. It's, you can't reconcile the story of who I was and who I am today, and you want to go say, What? Listen, my mother refused to go to counseling. She said she did not need to take a pill. She did not need to talk to a doctor. All she needed was Jesus. And I would say, you're jacked up, mom. You need help. Promise, I promise you that you need help. But some of us don't want to take that step. And we don't want to deal with it. We don't want to talk to somebody. There are professionals out there that are, that are actually equipped to help us. And they can help us. Do you know that those that go to counseling, the American uh, uh, Family Association said 98% success rate in dealing with the trauma, in dealing with the mental illness, and in dealing with the issue. In marriage, when you go to marriage counseling, which we have, we still have marriage counseling on a regular basis. It's not as frequent as it used to be, but you know, once a quarter we'll go and talk through the issues. 80% success rate. What would happen to marriages in America if every marriage stepped out to say, I need help, help me. I want to make it work. So it's super important to understand you deal with the root and the fruit will follow. You got to deal with the root and say, God, go deep in me. And I want to know what junk I need to deal with. And it's not just a one time. And, and, and listen, don't be one of those Christians that's a speak it and it is and declare it. Great. 
I speak it and declare it all the time, but in addition to that, I deal with my junk, right? And so, you know, when I mess up, I deal with that. I ask for forgiveness. I ask God to forgive me. I ask the individual I hurt to forgive me. So no change, no gain. No change and only our transformation. Third and lastly, seek out your purpose. Never settle for where you are. Despite your odds and your challenges, I am proof, ladies and gentlemen, I don't care where you came from, what issue you're dealing with, what past you have, what present. I am proof que si se puede. It can be done. It can be done. And David and I have changed the entire generational line of our family. In Jesus' name. Our children are healthy. Do they make the right you know, decisions? No, not all the time, but they're healthy. You're, if you're a parent in this room today, you have a legacy in your own children and their children. And then you have a legacy in the people that see you and the people that know that you love Jesus. You have a legacy to leave. So embrace your purpose. Embrace it for family, church, community. You understand your eternal destiny. Listen, I want to stand before God when I'm done. David and I want to stand before God and we want to hear him say, good, well done, good and faithful servant. Shame on us if we take all of this success that God gave us and we just live in our beautiful house and drive our nice car and go on vacation and deal with our family. Shame on us if we don't take what we've done and pay it forward and give it back. We do that through our nonprofit where we've served thousands of inner city kids, little David and little Rebecca's. We do that every day by, by, by saying to someone, believe in yourself. Like, go get help. Believe in your purpose. God is there to heal you. Never, ever, ever get to a place of an Eiffel Tower where you've arrived and you don't turn around and you don't help that hurting person that is dealing with issues. And listen, we are hurting in America today. There are so many challenges, even here in this room, I sense. But we've got to learn to give back and understand our purpose. Peter tells us you're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, not for yourself, but so that you can declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into this wonderful light. For we know that all things God works together for our good. Romans 8, 28 says, there are different stages of purpose. Stage one, salvation and forgiveness. Forgiveness of ourselves, forgiveness of others. Stage two, restoration. Restoration of relationships, body, mind, spirit. God is a God of redemption. You'll read about it in my book. He is a redeemer. He redeems mistakes. Stage three, growth. Get us healthy healthy with keys one two and three that i discussed training education empowerment counseling stage four open doors of influence god wants to open doors of influence for you he wants to bless you and impact others he wants to promote you because promotion comes from god okay we work super hard yes he's not gonna just wave his magic wand in the sky and make it happen but he opens the door of favor. Stage five, deeper level of growth, deeper mind, body, spirit, connection, healing. And then there's stage six, seven, eight, nine, ten, on and on and on and on. We keep growing in those transformative moments. If somebody had told me, ladies and gentlemen, when I was 17 and I was a high school dropout, addicted to drugs with no hope for a future, living in poverty with not even two pennies to rub together. Rebecca, one day you're going to be an advisor to the leader of the free world. I would have laughed in their face. If somebody had told me, you're going to get to be a mom. You're going to have a husband of 31 years. You're going to have grandchildren and you're going to leave a legacy of healthy children. I would have, I didn't even know what that looked like, Natalie, pastor. If somebody had told me, you are going to build a multi-million dollar company and have wealth and power for God purpose, I would have used the four letter F, the four letter word on that one. Yeah, I would have come out. Is that a mouth on me? 
but look God in his purpose and what's possible when we embrace our transformation when we embrace and reinvent and allow God to do the deep deep work that he wants to do in us so I encourage you be inked for purpose be inked in your life start with your family start with yourself and then ask God to show you the other areas of where he wants you to be no matter what you lack no matter your situation today where you are today does not need to be where you are tomorrow or the next day but God is able he's able to ink you for purpose if you are ever in the Seguin area come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessing.